What was very challenging for us, though, was just keeping up with the pace of data platforms. We went from distributed computers that we had set up on our own to managing Spark instances. As deep learning came about, that created totally different demands. And replatforming on your own hardware every time is incredibly difficult. Welcome to the Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. No journey to the cloud is the same. While some will encounter similar obstacles, each journey has its own unique challenges. But what happens when a company born in the midst of a crisis and changing technology has to innovate just as fast as the changing landscape to keep up? Ryan Graciano is the co-founder and CTO of Credit Karma, a company that is aligning technology and data to help bring transparency to the credit lending process. On this episode of The Data Chief, Ryan explains how Credit Karma survived early struggles, such as the financial crisis of 2008. Ryan also touches on how Credit Karma navigated its journey to the cloud, stepping away from the comfort of on-premises data centers to the elasticity of the cloud and the importance of grooming outside data sources to keep insights consistent. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for you to use search and AI to analyze your company's data lightning fast. Business people at companies like Walmart, Hulu, and Medtronic use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. And you can too. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. This week on The Data Chief, I'm excited to introduce everyone to a really hot company, but an inspiring CTO, Ryan Graciano. Ryan, welcome. Thanks, Cindy. It's great to be here today. So Ryan, where are you joining us from? I am in Oakland, California. Okay, great. And Ryan, you work and founded, co-founded one of the most fascinating financial services companies, Credit Karma. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I've been at Credit Karma for a long time. We started in 2007. So, I, geez, I don't even know how many years that is. A lot. More than... 14. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting, though? 14 years ago. Yes, it's been, it's been quite a ride. We were just last year uh, acquired by Intuit. So, that's been the, the latest part of our journey. Yeah, congratulations on that. And already you were at such... A significant scale, something like a third of all American adults, anyway, subscribe to Credit Karma. Where are you today? What's the latest numbers? Yeah, well over 100 million. I think we're close to somewhere around 120 in the United States today, adults. And it's all identified essentially by your credit report and social security number. So there's not really any duplicates in there. Right. Great. Now, so credit, a very hot topic in the best of times, and let's say in the most challenging of times in the last year in a pandemic. So give us a little bit of history. Where did the idea come from and how is Credit Karma different from the other credit reporting bureaus? Well, first, Credit Karma isn't actually a credit reporting bureau. Uh, so the idea was that you know only a few bureaus have access to your data. And when you go to apply for a loan, it's really hard to understand why you might be approved or denied. And the bigger idea was, you know, what if you didn't really even need to check your credit? What if there was a service that could tell you what you could be approved for? You know, so you don't necessarily want credit, you want your auto loan or your home loan. And so what we did was we created a, a site, a program where we could actually say, okay, here's everything in the universe that you could get and we can pre-approve you for what you need. Yeah, so it was really matching people, well, first off, giving a little more transparency on their credit scores. Sometimes somebody would just be denied for a credit card (laughs) or a loan and not really understand why, but matching them then with others that were willing to give them a credit card or a loan. Is that right? In the old world, so how you would apply for an auto loan would be you would have to pick auto loan company A, fill out a really long form, submit it, wait days, and then do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again. And actually, most people only do it really once because it's frustrating. And so the idea behind our service was, you know, hey, we could just take an anonymous version of you, basically, 
and then figure out, hey, who would anonymous Ryan be approved for? What, what would anonymous Ryan be approved for? And then we'll pick the best one and say, hey, here's what, you know, here's the best auto loan that you could get. Um, and it's just a much better experience than, you know, that one-off apply <laughs> process. Yeah. So I think it still is opaque to many. So we'll dive into that, but I'll tell you a funny story or (laughs) I don't know, you might say, yeah, it makes total sense. When I first moved back from Switzerland to the US, I had had credit in Switzerland, but I moved back. I could not get a gas card. I could not get a Sears credit card. We finally paid a furniture company cash for a sofa and said, we'll just buy it if you give us some kind of credit. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's actually a very common story for people who are new to the United States and for new grads from college who are yeah. used to their parents getting everything. They come out and uh, this happened to me. I tried to buy my first television for I think it was three hundred dollars and I I couldn't get financed. <laughs> so yeah, I just yeah. Ask my dad for a loan. There you go. <laughs> so build that credit <laughs> early, I think, is the the advice. So, Ryan, let's talk about how this is opaque or or what people I think are frustrated with are these black box algorithms, really, of which credit scores often are. So with Credit Karma explaining this to people, if you look in the last year, mass unemployment, people having to defer their rent, what's been the impact? Have have the algorithms been adapted to account for these unusual times? Or how do you explain that? Um, no, I wouldn't say that they've been adapted. I mean, the for the most part, you know, the risk models that people have been using uh, for the la- you know for the past many years, actually, a lot of banks will keep the same risk model in place over a long period of time, are still in place. Um, but you know, ideally, those models have seen good times and bad times, so that they're able to react a bit. And you know, what people forget about the whole system and why it's so confusing is that the the risk models are really there to be consumed by the lenders. Right. They were never designed for people to see. They were never designed to be explainable to people. And so that's something that we actually come up with after the fact, because those lending decisions are so impactful to people's lives. You know, that demand was created, but the system wasn't designed with that in mind. Right. So um, designed for a different beneficiary. So if you think about how your company's role is explaining that. Um, at least in part, where where do you view explainable AI in this? Yeah, it's very tricky, right? Because the yeah the the end who's the end user? Is it the person that's that's having the decision made about them, or is it the is it the company that's buying that score for some for some reason? And you know, really, the end user is the company. They're the ones that are paying for the model to be created, driving its creation, and then the person is sort of the subject. Of the model, yeah, and the challenging part is that you know it can be hard to warrant that that the model is a, is uh, acting in a fair way, and you know there's a bunch of legislation around this that tries to ensure that you know companies are doing fair things, they aren't doing things like redlining or discriminating against you know certain populations, um, you know which has you know has happened of course, um, and so the yeah the explainability problem is. Um, is a major one, um, both for regulators and for people, but for for the banks, they just want a good risk score. Yes. A good risk score and ideally a fair and equitable one. You refer to redlining and Credit Karma was quoted as saying, for example, there are biases in credit, gender biases that it would cost, this was actually in the Irish Times, but 17,000 um, pounds more for a woman's credit over uh, the life of their career than a man. So a credit gender gap. This is fascinating. How do we prevent this? Some of it is in the data that you allow the models to use, right? So, you know, I would really start there. I said some, that's honestly most of it. Because if you just sort of let the algorithm run unconstrained, it'll, it, it can't really necessarily tell the difference between correlation and causation. So it's a, if, there's a, if there's a gender pay gap, you know, then there's probably also a, a gap in the abilities for the genders to pay back. So there's probably a gender risk gap. And the algorithm will pick that up and just say, oh, well, there's a gap here. I don't know if it's, I don't know why. I just know that it exists. So I'm going to tell 
my banks not to lend to this uh, to this other gender that's you know having a hard time. So to prevent that, you actually have to remove some some of that data from the models because they can't you know they can't actually figure that out on their own. They don't know why. They only know what. Right. So the pay gaps, but even accounting for that, if we look two years ago, there was a lot of negative press about Apple's credit card being biased, how husband and wife joined to everything, similar earnings, joint bank accounts, and yet the woman had a lower limit, the man had a higher limit, and Apple couldn't really explain it. I don't remember the particular issue, so I can't comment on that one. And I know Apple uh, works with Goldman and who knows how how much Apple even has insight into how Goldman underwrites. My guess is not that much because yeah. the banks the banks don't like to share that information. <laughs> you know, they're the, for them that's the secret sauce. That's like the KFC recipe, you know, for them. Um, so they're very guarded about how they how they underwrite. Although they do have to pay careful attention to these things because the regulation is is quite severe. You know, the penalties are are very stiff for for violating. Oh, for sure. I think this is where a lot of it is unintentional or people not recognizing whether it's data gaps or or things that should be factored in or, or not factored in. But you've also, you've mentioned before that AI is overhyped. So how, and, and that we need to differentiate to artificial now intelligence. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. And so, you know, what I really meant by that is there are, you know, there are different types of artificial intelligence. There's generalized artificial intelligence, which is sort of like a human, right? So we're just generally smart. We can take a random problem set and and figure something out in a different domain. The AI that we use is is typically very narrow. So you can create AI that will figure out, am I a better risk than Cindy or vice versa? But then if you ask that same AI to play baseball, uh, it's not going to go so well <laughs> and because it's very narrowly defined. And so there are these two different types. And I think what we imagine the future being is generalized. You know, you, I want to talk to Jarvis and have Jarvis <laughs> tell me what I should do next. But uh, what we have is, is narrow intelligence. And don't get me wrong, narrow intelligence is phenomenally powerful. I mean, computers play Go better than people now and chess for a long time. But, you know, what I, what I see in the market is just everything is AI. Every statistical model is AI, which uh, which I think sort of just dilutes the term down to almost nothing. Yeah. AI washing, some people would call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good term, actually. That's very accurate. AI washing. Well, a- as a CTO, you think about how both technology and your role has changed over time. Cloud <laughs> was just an idea. Nobody believed it would become a mainstream or real thing. So you chose the Google Cloud platform, correct? We did, yes. We're primarily on Google Cloud. Okay. And I love this this quote that rather than um, you will continue to leverage state of the art as it comes, rather than trying to predict a trend or what will be the technology. So tell us a little bit why Google Cloud so early and where do you think all of this is going? For us, you know, we had developed so much infrastructure to make the site run that when we looked at other platforms, you know, a lot of their service offerings were around things that we, we kind of didn't really have an issue with. You know, I don't, I don't need a service bus if I already have a service bus and it works fine. And it's not that hard for me to move to the next one. What was very challenging for us, though, was just keeping up with the pace of data platforms. So we went from distributed computers that we had kind of set up on our own to managing Spark instances. Of course, there was Hadoop at one point. And then, you know, as uh, deep learning came about, um, you know, that created totally different demands. And replatforming on your own hardware every time is, is incredibly difficult. And then even if you abstract the hardware to a cloud, the software on top of that is, is crazy, um, you know, the, the migration. So we said, you know, we really want to be on a, a platform that seems like it's going to be on the bleeding edge of this because we're always going to be on the bleeding edge of this since our business depends on it so much. And Google, you know, I thought at the time was, was really doing the most there. You know, I was the most impressed with how BigQuery had managed um, data access. 
for a lot of use cases of ours internally and how they were moving towards um, you know tense kind of almost like a tensorflow native platform developing chips to make that more efficient to run and we thought that you know that would be the future for us and they were most likely to stay on the forefront right that makes sense so if you think you went through that migration of your owning your own data center to the cloud many large financial services organizations are in the throes of that and wanting to accelerate this journey. If you think about the different approaches of lift and shift, lift and redesign, build net new, and then go back and migrate, which model did you take and what would you recommend now knowing what you know now? I really liked our approach. And in retrospect, I think it was the right approach for us. So what we we did a little bit of, of both lift and shift and build net new. So on the data platform side, we went net new. We said, you know, it's time to move to something uh, different than what we use now. We want to move. Um, back then, we were looking for more of like a managed Spark and to get out of our um, then Vertica data warehousing into BigQuery. And so we said, we're going to build net new on Google for all of our data platforms and then migrate our applications to, to use them. But in the data center for all of our production workloads to actually serve consumer traffic, uh, building that new wouldn't be possible. Just the sheer lift would be incredible. So our approach there was a longer term lift and shift kind of approach where we were moving workloads, you know, bits at a time. And then we, we did one large move where we essentially tried to replicate more or less what we're doing in the data center on cloud um, with a long term goal of replacing chunks entirely. Right. Good. So, and when you think about this, you know, some of the more, let's say, slower moving organizations, they'll still push back and say, yeah, but the cloud is less secure, even though the data tells us it's not. Where do you think, well, I guess two parts. Do you think it's more secure, less secure? And where is this fear coming from? I mean, I definitely don't think it's less secure. I think that that's a very, that's very much an aging yes. point of view for a lot of reasons. You know, even things like, you know, how much work do you have to do to secure your own Kubernetes cluster and keep that patched and up to date? It sounds great at first, but three years in, keeping all of those nodes patched and concurrently working and then, you know, having your threat monitoring and all of the other trappings that you need around that versus just using Google's managed Kubernetes service, which is a black box, and they're securing it is night and day. And most most products in cloud are like that. It doesn't solve for all, you know, all issues. And, the, and cloud brings its own, you know, security problems and kind of figuring out how to manage their, you know, their sometimes Byzantine permissions and access controls. But you know, from from my point of view, most companies don't have the resources that a Google has. <laughs> To right. secure its Kubernetes cluster. For sure. I mean, even look at the breaches, whether it's the last month or the last year, the pipeline uh, breach. <laughs> it was legacy on-premises systems, the hospitals, the schools, all on-premises systems, not, not the cloud. And yet I do want to clarify. So really, though, the ownership of the security does not totally go away. So even though you say it's Byzantine, you still making sure that your data is protected, is you didn't, don't give up responsibility for that, even though somebody else is managing some of it. No, not at all. Yeah, you, you need to com- completely retain all responsibility for your own security. It's just what you, what you want is to have your people move up a layer in the stack. And so let Google worry about the nuts and bolts of the Kubernetes security. And then you can worry about, well, how are our people actually managing those Kubernetes, you know, those Kubernetes instances, what kind of logical access controls have you set up? What kind of monitoring you have? There's all kinds of stuff that's a layer on top of that, you know, beyond like, okay, did I patch the JVM on each one of those machines, which is actually a lot harder than people think it is to manage. And the other benefit with the cloud, if I think about where machine learning is going and predictions it, t- tell us a little bit more about how you benefit from, let's say, Google ML or just all the compute and elasticity that the cloud brings. 
Yeah, I was going to say the elasticity is very important, especially when you're deep in R and D phase. And so, you know, we go through, we do go through some pretty significant platform changes. I would say every couple of years. And when we're doing that, there's a ton of R and D work that's that's causing, you know, extra demands. And when we were in data center, it was very hard to manage that. You know, we would actually just run out of resources, and it wasn't possible to go and order a whole bunch more just to make R and D work, just to prove out an idea. Um, but in Google, it's much, you know, we have, you know, many, many terabytes into the petabytes of data. And for us, you know, it's, it's really hard to run R&D on that and not, you know, require some kind of elasticity. So you refer to R&D and designing the customer experience requires some experimentation. So take us through how, how you go through this process when you're designing new data products. For data, it's interesting. You really have to start with, well, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish for the end user? So what should the experience be for them? And then you have to think through what, okay, well, what data will power that? Uh, before you even think about the algorithms, it's just, you know, okay, do we have all the data that we even need? And often you'll find no. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of AI is actually just gathering data and grooming it. And so, you know, that's where a lot of our time is spent. And we're actually, Google has been very helpful because um, BigQuery and some other tools make this, you know, pretty easy for us, for the folks doing the R&D to actually kind of groom and, and manage. For us, you know, we have a pretty sophisticated data science team that's able to apply, you know, standard techniques and then usually we can get to a, a proof of concept, you know, fairly rapidly once we figured out all of those, you know, kind of data hurdles and so on. I guess I didn't touch on there's a, there's like a whole application development. <laughs> yeah, no, that. no, we don't. But you know, I'll skip that part. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, no, we don't need to get into the innards of that. <laughs> yeah. But um, well, you talk about the data science team. Does Credit Karma have a chief data officer for your internal? usage, like looking at things like marketing analytics, financials, customer experience analytics? Uh, we don't have a chief data officer. No, we have uh, heads of analytics in different domains. So we have one over what I would call sort of all of our product experiences and another that's over a lot of our monetization and strategic analytics. Uh, and then we have heads of you know, head of data science and a head of you know, what I would say are recommendations and machine learning. And they they all sort of operate to different ends, um, depending on you know what what their you know priorities are in a given year. Okay, so that's that's interesting. So really, a federated model, or is it per functional area? Like, does the data science team interact with the marketing analytics and the data monetization team, or is it everyone in their own domain? They do. They do interact, um, although it, it depends. Mostly what they'll spend their time on is for us uh, recommendations and the algorithms that power what you see on our site, what you see in your email, what you get in a push notification. You know, those things are what they'll spend a lot of their time on, uh, along with, you know, hey, what, what loans will you be approved for? What kinds of products can you get? That's most of their work. And then we'll have we will have folks who do, you know, some data science and predictive, predictive stuff in those other functions, typically on a smaller scale, you know, not using like a deep learning approach. Okay, great. So then um, if I think about your business model and the domain that you're in and being early to cloud, there's a couple common themes that come here. Would you say that the whole company has a high level of data literacy or data fluency, or is that something you still have to work on in particular domains? We are very data focused as a company and pretty much our whole executive team <laughs> comes from some kind of math, science, engineering backgrounds, very uh, common or finance. So it's a very data literate group, but you do still have to work at it, actually which is what I wouldn't have found so obvious when we, when we started building an organization. And that's actually why we have the analytics orgs. Um, so we have two analytics organizations for these different domains, but they create standards for how data is reported internally, which is really important because when just sort of anybody can report data, you find a lot of issues with bias and sample sizes and, you know, the way that things were done and um, also sort of uh, 
I don't want to say honesty in reporting, but just more, you know, is there, is there an angle? Whereas the analytics organization tends to be a bit more neutral. If you're a product manager pitching something, uh, well, you want the data to say, which yeah. <laughs> support what you're saying. So, you know, the analytics org has been very helpful in, in keeping us honest. Yeah. So add this capability. The data says add this capability. We, we, we'll call it vanity metrics if somebody intentionally changes it. But I think sometimes there's that confirmation bias. You find the data that supports the decision that you've, you really want or maybe that you've made. And if you want to make a case and you have enough data, you can always find some data to support your case. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That's where I always advocate that you need the contrarian on your team to push back and just check, um, you know, what are the blind spots or what have you. But you said something um, interesting that you surprisingly have to work at it, even though the executive team and the people are data-driven, value data and analytics, you still have to work at it. How do you work at it? Are there particular processes or reinforcements to make sure that people are are using the data well and always upskilling here? Yeah, I think one of the data mart layer, you know, at the actual data that the analysts use, that has to be really clean. And so you have to spend a lot of time making sure that if analyst A is looking at a problem and analyst B is, is looking at a problem, they're going to both use the same data to get there. Uh, and if, you're, if your data is sort of ungroomed all over the place, even if they're both trying their best, they might actually pull the data differently and come to different conclusions. And so that's a lot of work in its own right. Right. So then how do you, um, you mentioned the data mart and then there's maybe different versions in a data lake, unmodeled data. As technology has changed over time, are you seeing one area, let's say the the data lake house, to use a generic term, that is making it less necessary to have these different copies? Or do you think it's still necessary as a way of getting to a clean or common data model? I think it's still necessary to do some grooming, although, you know, how we actually do it, it sort of views into that data lake. Um, That's probably the best way I could describe it. You know, we have this sort of one giant schema, the super schema, which uh, we call it, which is uh, makes it possible for us to create these views. And then we would like it so that, you know, if you're looking at our mortgage business, for example, for our analysts to generally be looking at the same the same view of that data. Um, and not pulling, you know, kind of tertiary data to figure out what they're trying to get at. Yeah, grooming is a good word for it. So you mentioned sourcing data a couple times. Where do you, how do you go about sourcing external data? Does that play a big role? It is important to actually figure out, you know, just even simple things like, you know, hey, uh, this person told me their age. Does that age match with, you know, the age that I'm getting from the credit bureau or the age that I saw on their loan application? Because you could just get all of these different discrepancies, right? And those discrepancies really impact the, the final outcome of the model. And, and this is where that grooming is so important. And so if you have systems that can kind of pull data from wherever, and you have three ages in your system, where you're going to get three different results. So that is a is a lot of work in it in its own right, and we we'll we'll get data from you know of course the bureaus are our our biggest partners, but often we just sort of work with the consumer and and ask them you know hey what are you trying to do and if you're trying to apply for a mortgage you know what kind of home do you want right and this external data there has been an explosion of data marketplaces the cloud makes it easier to find these without having to necessarily move the data or or do FTPs back and forth. Are you seeing a change in the types of data you're ingesting or wanting to add to your models? Integrations are definitely a lot easier now because more and more people are on cloud and it just does make for simpler, you know, simpler processes and more more standardized. So, you know, I definitely have seen that be a thing. Great. So if I look at your background, Ryan, (laughs) and it's so impressive, but two jobs, really, or two companies over your career. If you think back when you were first graduating from college, did you envision founding such a hot company, such an important company, or um, what surprised you in this journey? 
A lot of things surprised me. <laughs> a lot of jobs, few companies. Yeah, we, I, I went out of, uh, when I graduated school, I, I went and worked for a small company and I avoided big companies because I thought that a 60 person type of startup would be the place for me and, you know, bigger impact and all that sort of thing. And then we were immediately acquired by IBM. <laughs> oh, so I only saw IBM. Maybe that was the thing. I thought, wow, he went straight to IBM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't even bother okay. putting the other company on my resume because it's like oh. two months. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the extreme then. Talk about extreme. Yeah, it was wild. Yeah. I was uh, sold on this small company by the then head of engineering and he was pitching me on, oh yeah, you can make such an impact and the culture is so great. And it's funny because I had interviewed with IBM and I had walked away from that. And then <laughs> two weeks later, oh, we're being acquired by IBM. Oh gosh. Yeah. That's a big change. But I, I would imagine though, you learned some of, let's say the discipline and the processes that are also required to turn, grow into a big company. It was a really interesting experience. It actually gave me a lot of perspective that I don't think I would have gotten otherwise. It was in, in hindsight, it was it was very fortunate to see a small company acquired by a big company because I learned much about you know the the differences in how people work together and like what the you know what what is that integration process like and you know what makes that work and not work and. It was a really unique thing to begin my career with, to have these two stark, starkly contrasted experiences back to back like that. And I stayed at IBM for a few years because, uh, yeah, again, uh, not many companies, but lots of jobs. I, I kind of job hopped every six months to try to get a, a feel for what different roles were like and how different groups worked together and how development teams worked. And uh, even at, you know, a, uh, and IBM, which was very process driven and had a lot of standardization, there's a lot of difference in how, you know, and how people worked. And so it was a really, it was a really valuable experience. Yeah. And if you think about going from a big company to then co-founding a, a startup at the time, were there times in the early days or in the growth stages when you just thought this model is the business model is not going to work? Or there was just a decision that you really wish you could back out of? We had a great start and then a terrible start. <laughs> That's how I would describe the beginning of our company. Because of the financial crash shortly after? Yes, yes. So we started in 2007 and we had immediate consumer traction. So people love the products you know, right away. Um, amazing feedback, tons of user traction. But our model is based essentially on landing and connecting people to... You know, if you want to buy a car, we'll help you get an auto loan. But that model doesn't work when banks are collapsing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not a nobody great time. was lending. No, nobody's lending. Uh, and so, from you know, 2008 to around 2011, there was no money. There were no VCs that were willing to invest in us. There was very limited limited opportunity for us to actually make revenue on the site. So it was it was pretty dark, uh, pretty dark time. Um, you know, for a lot of reasons. And definitely I had a lot of people asking me, you know, is this still a thing that I want to do? <laughs> they have a, they have another opportunity, you know, a lot of those types of uh, inbounds, but I thought that the product was, was so good. And the user feedback was so strong that, you know, I, I just believed that, you know, we would get through that tough time. Yeah. So right market fit, but difficult timing. And if you think, so some of our listeners are in the entrepreneurial space, but some are also just change agents within their own organizations. How did you get through that time? Is it just <laughs> getting up every day and saying, all right, we just need to get past this? Or is it surrounding yourself with positive people or anything specific? You know, we did just try to keep our heads up. So there was that. Uh, and then a lot of it was just the logistics of staying alive was how do we bring in income and keep this thing going? When, and so we, you know, we came up with ways to, you know, build sites for credit unions and, and things like that that would provide credit access for their, for their members and things that were sort of tangential to really what we were trying to do, but they weren't a lot of extra effort for us and they would bring in sort of enough money to keep us afloat. And so we had to just be creative with how we, you know, how we got through that time. 
So the industry is so fast paced, Ryan, how do you keep up with what's happening in the technology? Is it networking, reading, podcasts? Number one are, are the people. So the, the people around me, I try to surround myself with experts in their field who are just always going to be way ahead of me and then talk to them. I have monthlies with a lot of our higher ranked engineers where I'm just asking them, you know, what are your biggest issues? What's going on in your field? What are you excited about? Um, and then constructing a lot of that. So just so I get people, you know, talking about what they're interested in, even if it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, with us, um, because you never know someday it might, right? And people were excited about deep learning long before it was something that we could actually implement. But, you know, capturing some of that excitement, usually it gets me interested. And then I start doing, you know, some of my own reading and some of my own networking and asking around. And, you know, it's, it doesn't take long from, from there for it to become a conversation topic, you know, in right. the office. Yeah. So if you look ahead a few years from now, what would you like your legacy to be either at Credit Karma or let's say on the industry as a whole? At Credit Karma, I, I would love the organization that I built to be my legacy. You know, and I think that that's the most impressive thing that we've done is just built, build this group of people and I'm always amazed by how much they surprise me. Uh, and, you know, that's the, been the most rewarding part of my career is that there's this time in which, you know, kind of every idea is sort of your idea <laughs> you know, when you're small enough uh, and you're kind of behind or a big part of every technology decision. And, you know, now today we're big enough to where I'll, you know, I'll see something the data team's done and think, oh, wow, that's cool. I would have never thought of that. Yeah, that's nice. And how many employees now? So we're around 1,400 at, at Karma today, and a good chunk of that are in my organization. I think I have around 800 or so. Great. Wow. That's a large engineering organization. And if you look back in the last year, I always like to end with one of two questions. I'm going to let you decide either <laughs> something that's made you laugh out loud, tears running down your cheeks, um, or what are you most grateful for? You know, I'm, well, I'll, I'll definitely do what I'm most, most grateful for, you know, this, this last year, I'd say I'm most grateful for, you know, my health and my, and my family's health, but I'm just grateful our, our nation kind of made it through, you know, in, in last April and May, our, our consumer research team was talking to our members about, you know, the experiences that they were having and the furloughs and the layoffs and this, the, what people were doing to survive. And, and we were wondering how long can this go on? You know, how long can, you know, how long can we keep this up? And, you know, it's remarkable to me here that here a year later, you know, people are vaccinated and things are opening up again. And, you know, there's a, a ray of hope there for us. So, you know, that's definitely what I'm most grateful for. Yeah, that's so well said. I mean, we are, a, we are a country, a melting pot of pioneers. And so maybe it's, it's been a tough year for everyone, pioneers and entrepreneurs. So Ryan, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for being on The Data Chief. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was, it was great, Cindy. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Data Chief. To learn more about today's guest, recommend a future guest, or hear more of the show, head over to thedatachief.com. If you have questions for Cindy or comments about the episode, give her a shout by dropping your thoughts on LinkedIn and tagging Cindy Housen. Join her on LinkedIn Live the first Thursday of each month for a live version of The Data Chief, where she'll share best practices and take your questions live. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Every review helps more people discover the podcast and helps us improve our content. The Data Chief is brought to you by our friends at ThoughtSpot. Searching through your company's data for insights doesn't have to be complicated. ThoughtSpot makes it easy. With ThoughtSpot, anyone in your organization can easily answer their own data questions, find facts, and make better, faster decisions. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com.